Thank you so much for coming tonight and thank you Lizzie for the invitation to talk to you all this evening about invasive seaweed at the Channel Islands. Before we get started though, I want to take just a couple of minutes, uh, excuse me, first I'll point out that tonight I'll be talking mostly about the seaweed that's pictured here on the screen. It's called Sargassum horneri or devilweed and it's what I study for my dissertation at UC Santa Barbara. But before we get into that, I want to spend just a couple minutes going over what invasive species are and why we should be concerned about them. Maybe some of you already know this. Anybody have a guess of what makes a species invasive? Non-indigenous, great. Yeah, it's not from the, not, not native. Excellent, yes, it has negative effects on the plants or animals that are already there, perfect. Yeah. Excellent, great. Yes, absolutely, yes, they're very opportunistic, good colonizers, good at just becoming very abundant, spreading in a place where they've been introduced, excellent. You have hit on most of the key points, though the one other component is that they're introduced by humans, right? So they arrive in places that they wouldn't have really probably come to naturally on their own. Great, and uh, let's see. So uh, the Channel Islands are no stranger to invasive species. In fact, uh, islands, the, the major driver of species extinctions on islands is actually from invasive species. And I'm going to talk to you tonight about just a couple of examples of invasive species that have uh, been a problem on the island and also how the park has chosen to sort of manage and deal with those and, and just give a sense of what, what sort of our toolbox is on land to deal with invasive species. And some of you may already be familiar with these stories. How many of you work for the park or are part of the Naturalist Corps volunteers? A couple of you? Excellent. So you probably will have heard these stories already. And for those of you who aren't as familiar with the park, or those viewing online maybe, um, this is, these are the five Channel Islands that comprise the Channel Islands National Park. They're off the coast of Southern California here. And the two stories I'm gonna tell you about first tonight are both from Anacapa Island, the one um, kind of closest to land there. And so these islands in the park really, uh, the intention of the park was to protect the rich cultural and natural history and biodiversity of these islands. That's why it was really established in the first place. And it, these parks, these islands are home to many rare and indigenous uh, plants and animals that are found nowhere else in the world. And um, unfortunately, they're fairly vulnerable to uh, invasive species coming in and, and sort of becoming abundant and, and taking up resources that are required by those native species. So uh, this is a picture of a Scripps marlet. It's one of the very special birds that we have in the Channel Islands. They're sea, seafaring birds, I guess you could say, but they're, they only breed in these offshore islands of Southern California and off of Baja, Mexico and actually 80% of the breeding populations are within the Channel Islands, on the islands there. And uh, they've had a rough go of it because of us. Uh, fortunately, black rats are really good stowaways. And in the early 1900s, when uh, folks started visiting the Channel Islands by boat, we unfortunately brought black rats to some of the islands, including Anacapa. And it turns out that these rats are excellent predators of merlet and other seabird eggs. So. Uh, my understanding is 96% uh, of the merlet nests on Anacapa Island were being predated by these black rats. And um, at some point, the park decided, uh, you know, these populations were crashing. Like I said, they're very dependent on this habitat. And so the park and their partners decided to try to eradicate black rats from Anacapa in, a, in an effort to save these birds. And so between 2001 and 2002, they did manage to do just that. 
Um, this is a figure on the left hand side here showing you um, hatching success of the Scripps marlet's eggs before and, at, and soon after the removal of black rats. And we see that about 30% hatching success was happening while they were being predated and uh, jumped up to 82% very soon after the removal. So this was a great success story. Um, It was fairly controversial in some circles. They used, uh, it was quite an operation. They used poison. They brought, they brought rat poison over by, yeah. So it was a process where they were really careful to make sure that it didn't uh, affect any of the native field mice that were here. They also, I believe, captured all of the peregrine falcons because they didn't want any um, ill effects kind of traveling up the food chain. So I think it was a very, very careful effort. It took a lot of work to make sure that the, it didn't impact any other animals on the island, but they did end up sacrificing the <clears throat> uh, So it's not just invasive animals that are problematic. We also can have problems from invasive plants as well. And so, as I mentioned, Anacapa is home to some very special of rare endemic plants that are found nowhere else in the world. Oh, I jumped ahead of my slide there. Uh, this is an image from 1978 from Anacapa Island. And you can see that uh, back then, we could see a really nice mosaic of, of diversity of the vegetation there. Um, <laughs> invasive species don't have to come by accident. We actually are responsible for many of them and in introducing them intentionally. So like many places in coastal California, um, at Anacapa Island, ice plant was introduced on purpose to control erosion there. And unfortunately, it did better than expected and, and began to sort of dominate and grow over a lot of native species. And so there was a lot of many native plant species became, populations got sort of dangerously low. I believe there were even possibly some extinctions that happened. And so again, the park decided uh, to try to do something about this. And so uh, they, for a three-year period, and maybe some of you in the room have helped with this, they removed a lot of ice plants just manually. So that was sort of phase one of this restoration project, was ripping it all out, particularly close to nesting seabird habitat, because the seabirds, uh, while they can nest in caves, they prefer to do it under native shrubbery. And so they're focusing on those areas first, and now I think they're kind of entering into phase two, where they're growing native plants in this nursery. and uh, doing out planting, so trying to sort of speed up the recovery process and restoration process. So, uh, and this is something they've been doing on other islands as well in the past, like at Santa Barbara Island, and I, I hear that they're having good success in getting some nesting um, seabirds in that vegetation that they've restored already. So again, a great successful effort, but we do need to keep in mind that um, this success comes at a cost. These projects both cost millions of dollars, countless volunteer hours, and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And um, you know, this is just one or two examples that I've shared with you here. The actual estimated cost of the impacts and management of invasive species in the U.S. alone is actually $130 billion. Yeah, wow. Um, so even so, invasive species do undermine the goal of national parks, which is to preserve unimpaired the natural and cultural resources and values of the natural park system. And so the park has clearly recognized the need to manage invasive species to keep uh, in line with this mission and to preserve native biodiversity. But we have to remember that the park boundaries don't just end at the high tide line, right? They extend for a mile offshore of each of these islands. And so there's actually a significant amount of area that is within the park that's underwater that we're still responsible for, right? And unfortunately, invasive species are a problem down there too. <clears throat> so just for a moment, I suppose, I, I didn't know how much of kelp forest y'all have seen. Now that I'm in this room, I can see you're no stranger to them. <laughs> but uh, a colleague at UCSB made this beautiful video. It's five minutes long, but it, it does a great job of sort of capturing the treasures that are within the kelp forest inside the park. Um, these are just basically taken by 
uh, several divers who worked for Pisco that partnered it's a, long mouthful, uh, a monitoring group in Santa, Bar Santa Barbara that um, does a lot of monitoring work within the park. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to play this, enjoy it, and just let the beauty sink in.
So we can thank Katie Davis for that video. She did a fantastic job. I asked her if I could show it tonight, and she graciously said yes. <clears throat> so the whole purpose of that was really to drive home, which I'm sure you already believe, that um, kelp forests are incredibly special places, and it's really not just the, the kelp themselves that we we're concerned about, but also all of the species that it supports either through as food or habitat, lots of species rely on the kelp for um, nursery space. And so uh, when we think about invasive species in the kelp forest, we're really talking about, um, we're kind of thinking about that whole ecosystem, right? And how, uh, how any, any part of that or every part of that could be affected. And so the park has in recent years been confronted with um, in a couple of invasive species in the water. And this is one of them here. This is the one I'll be talking about for the rest of the night. Let me see if this works. I don't think this worked. No, okay, I'm gonna stay back here the whole time then. Um, the laser, wait, how did, how did you? Oh. On. Ah. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so this species here, this is the, um, it's called Sargassum horneri or devil weed. And it's, um, I guess it's what I study for my dissertation. And, and um, this is a picture from Santa Catalina Island in 2013 when Sargassum was first kind of becoming abundant there. And it's, since then it's really started to kind of become more dominant on these reefs that have been historically dominated by the giant kelp pictured there, Macrocystis pyrifera. And there's still a lot that we need to learn about how marine invasions occur, what impacts they have, and what we, we might be able to do about them. And so in this talk, I'm going to tell you a bit about what I've been learning about the species Sargassum horneri uh, in terms of where it came from and where, did it, where it spread to, um, exploration of why it's so successful here, now, whether or not marine protected areas are able to resist invasion by this species. Um, can you weed a seaweed? Is there anything we can do to try to control it by removal? And, and the bigger picture as we finish up here, talk about how we can fight marine invasive species um, in general. And so I will start with where did it come from? Where did it go? So this seaweed is native to Japan. It was first detected in Southern California in 2003 in Long Beach Harbor. And this is the only place in the whole world where it's been found outside of its native range. Um, it's thought to have been introduced by commercial shipping simply because it was found in the harbor first. And that's very common for invasive species. Since 2003, it's spread fairly rapidly uh, out to the Channel Islands about halfway down Baja, California. And in 2009, it was first found in the park at Anacapa Island. And it's since still been moving sort of northward and westward and is still actively spreading. Okay, that was a quick, easy section. Don't get, don't get too used to that. So now, why is it successful? We really knew very little about this species when um, people started kind of noticing how abundant it was becoming. And so a lot of my work has been to just sort of try to characterize the life history of the seaweed in Southern California and try to understand what it's doing and how that relates to what native species are doing to try to get a sense of what its impacts might be and what may be sort of mitigating its, its spread and impacts. And so I'm gonna tell you about a few of those surveys and what we've learned. Um, the first thing we did was ask, well, where does it grow on the reef, right? Algae have this range that they're um, optimized to grow in somewhere between, they're limited in the intertidal by desiccation. They have to be wet for some part of the day, right? So at some point in the intertidal, you stop seeing algae and they can grow down deep enough until they don't get enough light. And so that range is somewhere down to a little over 100 feet, let's say, maybe. And so we wondered where in this range sargassum grew. And so we did these surveys at four sites around Catalina Island um, from the intertidal down to about 100 feet. And we recorded its density and biomass of sargassum and also of the native species. 
What we found is that it has uh, its present throughout that entire range I just described where native algae tend to grow. Um, but it's really uh, not very abundant at about five, less than five meters. So it's what, 15 feet or so. Um, does very well in the sort of intermediate depth range and then less so as it gets deeper and deeper. This is in contrast to the native algae and you don't need to worry about what these species are here. Just know that there are other sort of similar um, understory large bodied species. So you could consider them sort of functional equivalents. And we see interestingly, uh, well, one thing to note is that different species favor different depths, right? Like this one right here is halidries. It does really well in the shallow areas, but you don't see much of it elsewhere. Whereas there are some other species that do, do much better at deeper depths where it's calmer, but there's less light. But the interesting thing to note is that taken all together, these stacked graphs show a totally inverse relationship from sargassum where in really shallow, uh, there's more native algae, really. Uh, and then in these areas where sargassum is abundant, we see much less uh, of the native algae overall. And so really what we saw there is that the sargassum is inversely related to the sort of aggregate biomass of native species of its kind. Very interesting. So based on that information of where we found it on the reef, we decided to do a lot more sampling in that zone where we found most found it was most abundant. So we targeted a seven meter depth zone and visited 31 sites around Catalina Island. Um, we visited these monthly to quarterly, so every one to three months for two years. And the point of this was to document the life cycle of this species. I don't think I mentioned yet that it's an annual species, which is sort of unique to this this area, most of the native algae are perennial, meaning they um, live through multiple uh, reproductive cycles. So they're sort of more longer lived, essentially. And so the time of year when sargassum undergoes these different phases of its life cycle could be informative when we start to think about impacts and what's why it's um, more or less successful in certain areas. So I'll first walk you through what that life cycle is here. Um, when they're really small, they look like this. They're sort of fern-like. They're quite pretty. And um, I call these recruits, but it really just means that they're under five centimeters is how I define them, it's under just a few inches. Um, at some point, uh, oh, I should mention that these uh, individuals can be very dense. So this is an image that's not uncommon underwater where we see these sort of blankets of these recruits forming. At some point, they grow a stipe that grows vertically up into the water column, and it can form this sort of dense canopy. It almost looks like a forest, if you didn't know any better here, um, that potentially may limit light that can reach the bottom for other species. At some point, that vertical growth ceases, and it develops these reproductive structures. They're called receptacles. Um, and when reproduction actually occurs, I call this ripe, but it's um, when the the individuals, they basically exude their eggs and sperm at the same time and fertilization happens on the surface of these structures. And they can drop, these are um, under the microscope images of those little balls. And they're actually fully formed zygotes that can just drop right to the bottom of the leaf and start growing. So it gets to your point, you brought up that it's very good at um, sort of opportunistically becoming abundant once one individual um, gets established. And after that reproduction happens, it senesces and dies and comes completely off the substrate. So what we found in terms of the seasonality of when it undergoes these different phases is, um, I'll first show you density. So there's this large, um, it's much more abundant in the summertime. And as the season progress, it progresses into fall, winter, and spring, it becomes less and less abundant. And if we break this down into those different life stages I just described, we can see that the majority of that peak in number is um, due to this recruit stage here in the summertime, the number 125 individuals per meter squared. This area about yay big. It's quite a lot for an average. And then as time goes on, as the seasons go on, we see this very distinct shift in the life stages where um, in the winter time, we see a lot of the, that immature stage when they're starting to grow up vertically into the water column. And then very rapidly in the springtime, that reproduction happens very quickly. It forms those receptacles, 
becomes ripe, has, undergoes fertilization, and then quickly dies soon after. And so the interesting question then is, well, what does that mean for biomass? I showed you that these, these individuals can get fairly tall. And we see that in the summertime, it contributes very little biomass. This is a very minor amount. But then in the winter and spring, that time of year when we see that growth, um, there's actually a huge, huge boom of biomass for just that period of time of the year. And again, we can look at those life stages and see that um, in blue here, it's that immature stage in the wintertime that's responsible for that biomass. In the lighter shade, a uh, little bit of um, biomass due to the mature phases in the winter, but mostly in the springtime here, and then that fertile uh, ripe stage where reproduction is happening. And so essentially it's, it's that, that big bodied phase I showed you, um, again, that's contributing that biomass, but only during the winter and springtime. And so now the question is, well, what does that mean relative to what the native species are doing? So unfortunately we couldn't sample all the native species at all of these sites, it's a lot of work. So we had to pick just one site, and we selected this place called Isthmus Reef. And we sampled the native algal community um, just quarterly every three months between 2014, and we're still doing that sampling actually now. And I'll show you just, uh, again here, this is that same figure I showed you of the sargassum biomass, and underneath it I'll just show you the kind of aggregated biomass of native species that we've been seeing seasonally at that one site. And on the left here is pictured just a smattering of, of what those generally are. And again, we see this pattern where there's higher, biom higher, it's sort of an inverse pattern again with the natives where we see higher biomass in the summer and fall of the native species. And as it declines, we see an increase in sargassum. So again, it, you could look at this as um, sargassum is just sort of filling this empty niche or taking advantage of this opportunity in space and time where the native species may be underutilizing limited resources like space and light on the reef. And I'll just show you a couple of life history characteristics about sargassum that may also contribute to its success here. For one thing, I showed you it's very fast growing in that couple month period. <laughs> um, are you okay? <laughs> It's highly fecund, and so when I told you it develops those receptacles really quickly, those actually um, account for over 50% of its biomass. Yeah, so <laughs> um, it's monoecious, which means it has male and female gametes, and so uh, no one's actually tested this, but technically it is feasible that a single individual is able to uh, start a whole new population. And it's also well suited to short and long range dispersal. So I showed you those dense recruitment um, patches. And so that's showing just that you can get probably millions of recruits from a single plant in a small area like that. But also because these plants are buoyant, if they're ripped off the substrate when they're reproductive, they can drift long distances on currents and just drop babies as they go. And so they're very well suited once they become established someplace to continue to spread. So those are some of the things we've learned about um, maybe why it's very successful here, that it's able to take advantage of some possibly underutilized resources, and that it has some life history characteristics that are very well suited to colonization and persistence. Okay, next I want to talk a little bit about um, whether marine protected areas are able to resist invasion by sargassum horneri. And this is work that's actually led by Drs. Jen Cassell, I know she's spoken here before to you folks, and Katie Davis, the wonderful filmmaker. Um, and it's also work that the National Park Service Kelp Forest Monitoring Program has assisted with, with their um, monitoring data as well. I've been helping out a bit. Just need water for a second, excuse me. Katie and Jen. Um, maybe a helicopter? Seems a little high for a drone, doesn't it? I don't know. <laughs> um, so this, when we're going to go back to Anna Kappa now for this part of the story again. 
popular island. And uh, right, I guess should point out that those different dots represent the monitoring sites that both the Park Service uh, visits every year and also PSCO visits every year. So they're slightly, some of them overlap, some of them are different, but they've got the island fairly well surrounded with their powers combined. And so this is a time series of Sargassum Horneri at Anacapa since 2010. Um, and there's two things we can note here. So it's just the two different shapes or two different ways that they sample. You don't have to worry about that. Just look at the, the increase in the spread of these points. And we can see that um, between 2000, I told you before that it was found at the park first in 2009 at one site at Anacapa. And so starting in 2010, um, it was present, but didn't appear to be spreading very much, or at least wasn't very abundant. And then starting in 2013, we started to see a pretty big increase in density. And we uh, also see a good deal of variation, right, between 2014 to 2016. There's some sites that have a lot and some sites that don't. And so one question is, well, what's causing that variation? Why do we see a lot someplace and a little others? Well, at the same time that we were having a sargassum invasion, we were also having a marine protected area invasion. So I'm sure some of you know that uh, there's a, a historic reserve that's been on the eastern side of Anacapa Island since 1978. But with the expansion of the California marine protected areas that happened in 2003, we got two more of them. So those are the two newer ones on the left side. And then on the back side of Anacapa, there's no fishing regulation whatsoever. And so the question here was, uh, presumably with these different levels of protection, and I'll show you a figure in a minute with the exposure now, um, these regulations result in really different communities biologically. So in the... Um, the old reserve, this is data from a couple other studies that have been published years ago. Uh, on the right side, this is talking about that old reserve. We've seen uh, there's a dramatically larger number of predators like lobsters in the protected areas now than there are in the unprotected areas on the backside. And the idea is that that results in much lower densities of sea urchins, which are lobsters' preferred prey, and uh, conversely, outside the protected areas where there are much fewer predators, uh, we see inflated numbers of those herbivorous urchins. And resulting from that, we see a much greater um, abundance of native kelp in the reserves, and while we see uh, much less in the unprotected areas, likely due to increased herbivory by these urchins. And so we wondered, well, could this uh, protection and therefore difference in these communities be responsible maybe for the differences we see in sargassum? Remember, we already kind of suspect that sargassum is very opportunistic and does very well in these places that native algae aren't really taking advantage of as well. And so maybe we would expect that um, there would be more, uh, less sargassum in these places with healthy, robust kelp communities and less in the places that are more degraded. And then there's another question. So this is just sort of a schematic of what I just explained to you, where in the established MPA, we have a large density of predators, fewer urchins, more native algae. Conversely, in the fished areas, fewer predators, more urchins, less native algae. But then there's also this question of what's going on in the newer MPAs. Have they had time to mature enough to uh, have the same sort of structure as the established ones? Or what's going on there? We're, we're, we have less information on that. And so we looked in all three of these sites and asked, well, what's the, you know, what are those, what's the trophic structure in those three different uh, management zones? And then what is the relative abundance of invasive sargassum in them? And so I will show you what we found here. So first in the established MPAs, or just one MPA, excuse me, we found <laughs> Uh, not a whole lot of sargassum, as expected. And so our idea of why this is happening is what I just explained there, that the sargassum is experiencing um, more intense competition and shading from native algae, and therefore just has less resources available to take advantage of. However, on the fish side, we also saw very little algae. But 
we think that what is going on there is that it's actually not because of that competition from algae, it's more that the urchins are starving and they are directly consuming the sargassum. So it's not uncommon to see in these fished areas, I've seen like a picture there where we call them urchin barrens, but it's just many, many, many urchins and they've grazed the algae all that they can find down to nothing. It's sort of a desert out there. And so what we found is that sargassum doesn't do very well in those environments either. Now the question is what happens in these newer MPAs, the ones with more sort of transitional um, densities of all of these things, right? And so actually we found much higher levels of sargassum in these newer MPAs. And the idea here maybe is that, um, so maybe the native algae isn't really developed enough to uh, outcompete sargassum um, yet the urchins are not starving enough to eat it. And so this would all hinge on the feeding preference of urchins, right? If um, urchins will eat anything if they're hungry enough, but this in the middle here, the idea is that maybe given the choice, they'd prefer to eat tasty kelp than invasive sargassum. And so to see if that fits, um, if that could be a mechanism of what we're seeing here, we actually did some grazing assays with um, two common native kelps, the Macrocystis pyrethra giant kelp and the southern sea palm, Isenia arborea. Um, and I, did, I call this project algae buffets, but we provided them, we put out these kind of arrays of a sample of each of those kelps and of sargassum. We placed them in these urchin halos uh, and left them out for 48 hours put the same number out with cages on top of them to prevent grazing. Um, and then 48 hours later, picked them up, weighed the algae before and after, and simply compared um, the two treatments to see <clears throat> whether more tissue was lost from any of those, essentially, which ones were consumed. Um, I think you know what I mean. And so this is what we found. So um, weighing the two species of kelp, we Put out before and after that 48 hour deployment, um, we found that between 45 and 55 percent of the tissue was gone. So they liked it. Um, now, what would we expect if they don't like the sargassum as much, right, given the choice? This. So, what we found was that um, less than 10 percent of the sargassum was gone in these assays. And so this is not really surprising. Um, this type of algae, it's called a fucoid algae, tends to be really good at chemical defense against herbivory. So it probably just doesn't taste very good. Um, it may just, you know, anyway, that's likely part of an explanation of why it's doing very well here if herbivores prefer to eat natives unless they have no other choice. So that's sort of what we think is going on there. So, do marine protected areas resist invasion? Well, maybe if they've had enough time to really uh, restore mature kelp forest communities. But, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see as these um, newer MPAs kind of continue to mature, whether or not sargassum will really impede that progress, right? It's sort of hard to know. So we'll see if those transitional states kind of progress as the more historic ones have done or, or what happens there. And now we're getting into, can you weed a seaweed? So is there anything we can do to try to control the species through removal? And this is work that has been done in collaboration with a few folks, one Adam Obaza with the uh, NOAA Fisheries who uh, helped get funding for this project. Sam Ginther was a master's student at CSU Northridge and I worked with him on this project on slightly different things. And Team Sargassum on the right were these group of people that put in a huge amount of work for this project. Uh, so thank you to them. And I'm just going to, Adam made this fantastic video about the work. So I'm going to just play this and talk over it a little bit. So we essentially decided we wanted to see if we could um, I've already explained to you that sargassum is this annual species, right? So 
um, we can go out and remove it from areas and sure we make a dent, but the question is really what kind of impact does that have on the next generation, right? And so we, <laughs> the reason for this funding was to use this super sucker. It's an underwater vacuum that's been used uh, to control invasive algae in Hawaii, actually. Um, and so uh, some folks before I got the grant to do this work actually built the super sucker and tested it out a little bit in the harbor. And then my job was to see if we could really make a dent in any um, natural populations. And so uh, we feed the material into this hose and it gets sent up to the surface and where a diver sorts through it looking for bycatch. Luckily, we didn't find much at all. Um, this is a picture of one of our cleared plots. We cleared 60 square meter areas, so maybe half the size of this room is what that plot looks like, pretty large. We cleared 14 of those, it took us three days. We had to run the material back to shore to dispose of it upland. So, all told, we cleared almost a square, a, a, it's almost a square kilometer. It's about a square third of a mile is what I calculated in miles. It's a lot, a lot of area. <laughs> this is a picture of me standing triumphantly on top of everything we removed. Um, over four tons of material. And so you might wonder, you know, given that, uh, difference I showed you in biomass. Why did we choose to do this in February when it was biggest? Well, it was also the least dense at that time, right? They, we couldn't possibly think about trying to remove those tiny little recruits and those blankets. And so um, we focused on a time of year when, it, unfortunately, it was biggest, but it was also the least dense. And we tried to get it right before it was reproductive to try to kind of get the lowest amount of recruitment back into those spaces as we could. And so the question was, does that removal um, reduce densities in the next generation? And we found uh, that yes, dot, dot, dot. So um, this on the top figure here is density of the control and removal plots before we did anything. I call it baseline here in February 2015. And we can see these bars are very similar. Um, we went back again in September. We did the removals right after we did this survey work, right? Came back in September 2015, and that's the time of year when we'd expect to kind of find the most of those recruits based on that, that seasonality data I showed you earlier. So we, we sampled for recruitment in September, and we saw we actually were able to reduce recruitment by about 50% in the removal plots compared to control plots where we, we sampled, but we didn't do any removals in them. Sounds impressive, but unfortunately that 50% um, reduction turned into a 25% reduction as those populations matured and grew up. So we sort of sped up the self-thinning process, and but all we really did was kind of slow population growth. We still got a good deal of sargasso in the next generation. So the take home from this really was, um, it's a lot of work. Uh, yes, we made a little dent, but this isn't the best circumstances to do this in. If you notice from that video, we were working in an area that was very heavily invaded already. And so um, someone's carrying the torch on this project. Los Angeles Waterkeeper is doing sort of the next phase of this project, and they're going to be focusing in, I think, Palos Verdes. Um, and they're going to be working in a place that has some more established kelp populations there. And so the idea is when you do these removals, ideally there'll be native species to come in and take advantage of that space that's been created. And so hopefully they'll have a little more success um, working in places that are not quite so heavily invaded. But stay tuned for that. So can you weed a seaweed? Sort of. <laughs> stay tuned on if it's, a, you know, I mean, no matter what, we're not talking about eradication here, right? We're talking about maybe focusing on areas that like dive parks or or perhaps in more protected areas that you want to kind of keep as, as um, natural as possible. But at this point, we're talking more about trying to control it in a handful of areas. OK, so now we're going to just wrap up a little bit here by talking about how we can fight marine invasive seaweed or marine invasive species. And again, one more video. Unfortunately, it's me. 
This is a video we made um, to try to get people engaged in helping us monitor and track the spread of sargassum and other invasive species. So. We need your help to fight marine invasive species. <laughs> marine invasives are saltwater species that are not native to an area and they have unwanted impacts in their new location. These species are transported from their homes to faraway places as hitchhikers aboard ships or as aquarium pets released back into the wild. They can then be spread across local waters by boats, divers, and fishermen. Marine invasive species cause major economic and ecological impacts, costing billions of dollars each year to manage. If you're a certified diver, you can help us with this challenging problem. We're currently looking for two invasive algae spreading across the coast of Southern California and the Channel Islands. They're called Sargassum horneri and Undaria pinnatifida. We need your help to track these dangerous characters, pinpointing exactly where you've seen them. When you find an invasive seaweed, record the species, water depth, life stage, and the habitat where you saw it. Make sure you don't remove it, it's easily spread. Photos of the invasive algae are important too. If you have a camera, be sure to take a picture. Once you're back on board, record your GPS location and the name of the site where you were diving. And before you leave a dive site, make sure to check your gear and anchor and remove any hitchhiking seaweed. Back on land, report the invasive species you saw at marineinvasives.org. With this important data, we'll be able to document the spread and contain and minimize the impacts of the invasion. Have fun diving, and remember to report your sightings. Thanks for your help. <laughs> so that's something we can do to start with here locally, right? Uh, I don't know how many, how many of you are divers? Couple, excellent. Um, it, even if you're not, I'm sure you, maybe you know some divers or possibly you like to go out sailing, you're on the water, you go into the beach. And so uh, these are all places that you can spot um, these species and uh, help us keep track of where they're, where they're spreading to. Um, this is another case. So Undaria pinnatifida, I mentioned in the video there, is another invasive seaweed that is in the park now. But uh, this is this was its distribution up until last year. Anybody notice any pattern of what these points are? I guess. Ports. Yes, exactly. They're harbors. So I believe every harbor between Monterey and the border, it has Undaria in it. And it was introduced about the same time as Sargassum, a little couple years earlier in 2000, and within seven years had been spread to each of those ports. And so what does that tell you? That, you know, uh, this is also a species that's from Japan, but um, once a a, na a non-native species is introduced to a harbor, it's really by a local probably boating activity that's spreading it regionally after that. And so this species was just recently detected for the first time on the open coast at Anacapa Island again um, last summer by the National Park Service divers. And so it's not uncommon to see scenes like this where Andaria is growing on the side of the hulls of boats or kind of on the, uh, on the side of boat slips. Um, sargassum is also, just about every time I dive to do my work, I pull up the anchor and it looks like that in the winter time. Uh, so that's another way that we can inadvertently spread um, these species by ripping them up. And if you're not aware that they're a problem, you might let them go and let them drift away. Uh, or you might pull them off your hull if, to get it clean and let them go. That's not what you want to do. It's much better to take them off and throw them away on land. That way they can't start new populations somewhere else. Um, but keeping your, your vessels clean is a really good way to try to not, you know, we call it spread the word, not the weed. Um, we don't want to spread these things any further than they already have. So again, if you have a boat or you know people who do, uh, just keeping your eyes open for these two species and making sure that you're not inadvertently spreading them is something you can do to help. Um, also, as I mentioned, if you're a water person and you've got your eyes open, 
you can help us by reporting sightings at marineinvasives.org. This is a sheet that I've left out on your way out. You can grab one if you like, or give one to your diver friends. Um, but this information is really useful for us, especially if you're looking in places where we haven't had a lot of eyes in the water yet. So if you go to marineinvasives.org, you can actually see a map of all the places where these species have been recorded um, and also some gaps where we just don't have any information yet. So if you're interested in learning more um, on the local scale, visit marineinvasives.org. But just to close with the bigger picture a little bit. So this is an image. Anybody have a guess what this is? Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are major shipping um, vessels. So this is a snapshot of 2008. This is all the commercial vessel traffic from 2008. And what it says to me is that our coastlines are incredibly connected. Um, and that, that trend is only increasing. This is a, a figure from um, the ICUN that shows the number of invasions that have been detected in these four different global seas since the 1950s. And you can see in all of them, they're increasing, some faster than others. But the point here is, so not all introduced species that are brought to a new place are uh, become invasive, but some fraction of them do. And the point here is that, that fraction, that's becoming a fraction of a bigger and bigger number. And so I want to talk for just a couple of minutes about um, what marine dispersal vectors um, are, so how, how species are really getting spread across the world in the first place. So I made this great cartoon, please enjoy it. It's uh, how ballast water works. So that was a vessel uh, arriving in Port A, offloading its cargo. And uh, what happens when that happens? It gets lighter, right? And these vessels are designed to have, to drive with a certain draft, right? At a certain level of the water. And so once that happens, if they need to go to Port B, um, they often fill up their holes with water to try to get that the correct amount of weight again to achieve that optimal draft. And so going from port A to port B, they take that water with them. And when they arrive at port B, what happens? Pick up their new cargo, there goes the water. And so that's a very common way that marine invasive species are spread across the world um, is they can survive in that ballast water and get moved that way. Um, another way that they're commonly spread is by growing on boat hulls. This on the right-hand side is actually on Daria. Um, and so, you know, of course, if you're a boat owner, this isn't like how to optimize your fuel efficiency or anything. You want to deal with this anyway. Um, but, you know, even if it's not this dramatic, you may be spreading things um, you don't mean to be. I already mentioned this, boat anchors. Um, another major one is the aquarium trade. So. A lot of people, you don't want your goldfish anymore. You flush it down the toilet. You don't want your boa constrictor. You let it go, and then that's what happens in the Everglades and how the lionfish invasion started and inadvertent releases. So this is a big one. Um, uh, so as much as we can kind of keep invasive species in the conversation and make, make sure people aren't letting their pets go, that's a good thing. Aquaculture is another one, so this is a big one. Uh, invasive species tend to do really well on man-made infrastructure, so they either grow on these structures or um, a lot of times non-native species are imported and uh, aquacultures are uh, centered around these non-native species and inadvertently escapes happen, hybridization happens, and so that's another vector. And finally, packaging materials. So um, it's common practice to ship I don't know how common, but common enough to find a picture. Um, the bait will be shipped in seaweed. Um, shellfish cultures, I think, sometimes are, are shipped with seaweed like this. And you can imagine that sometimes this just gets thrown overboard once things are opened. So um, this is all to say that uh, focusing on vectors is probably the best thing we can do. I say that prevention is the best policy. This is a curve of um, kind of the, the cost of control uh, and as, a, as, an, as an invasion goes on with time. And the best place that we want to be when we're thinking about management is over on the left side here, thinking about prevention before an introduction happens. Um, we're pretty careful about this on land, right? So we try to limit the transport of um, produce, mostly for reasons of pests, but 
still, we're paying attention across state borders, across country borders. Um, there are campaigns called Don't Move a Muscle to limit the spread of invasive quagga and zebra mussels across lakes. So there, this is, there's actually laws in place to prevent this, um, require some process of cleaning <clears throat> boats so that they're not being transported to different lakes. And the park even, right? Uh, when you visit the park, I think this is something that the island packers share with their visitors, making sure that we're not introducing non-native species onto land in the park too. So we could be doing a good job of that, uh, maybe a better job of that in the marine environment. So let's say prevention fails and something does get past our firewalls. Um, there's a very limited time that we have to sort of consider eradication as an option. Um, on islands, the examples I gave you earlier, those uh, are achievable. It's kind of different when you think about islands because they're these finite spaces, right? And in the marine environment, it's a lot more continuous. And so there are examples of successful eradications. One of them is this here, the Calerpa taxifolia eradication. It's something that was detected in Los Angeles in 2000. <clears throat> it had already been very invasive in the Mediterranean. And so uh, people's flags were sort of raised very quickly. And actually within 17 days of the first detection, folks were in the water doing this tenting business and actually did manage to eradicate. Uh, they, they killed off all the patches that they found, did several years of monitoring after and have never found it again. So great success story there, but really uh, not the norm really requires that you do find something when it's truly um, brand new and act quickly. But this isn't foreign to us, right? We have a really great response to, uh, plan and funding in place to deal with things like chemical pollution, oil spills. Um, we could consider invasive species as sort of biological pollution and something that we need to be just as prepared for. And um, just my last point about this is, you know, why don't, why don't we talk about that? Why don't we have that? I think it's that folks just aren't quite as aware of the potential harm that invasive species can have and how much power we really have to try to minimize them. Um, it's just not really in the forefront of our conversations and I think that that's something that could change and that's something that you all can do to try to raise awareness. So I will wrap it up here with one minute left to just quickly summarize. Um, we've talked about sargassum came from Japan, has done really well here, possibly because uh, it's filling this sort of empty niche space that's underutilized by natives, but also it's just very well adapted to um, become successful. Um, do marine and protected areas resist invasion? We've seen that, yes, possibly historic ones do, but we're not so sure about the newer ones. We'll have to see. Is removal a viable strategy? Um, again, we'll have to see, certainly not in heavily infested areas, but hopefully in newer introduction sites or places with more robust um, native algal populations. And finally, how can we fight marine invasive species? Well, for one thing, don't be a vector yourself. Um, and for another, just talk about it. Get it, get it in the light. With that, I will just thank uh, the funding sources that have supported me through a lot of the work I told you about tonight, um, mostly different branches of NOAA, the National Marine Sanctuaries, California Sea Grant, and fisheries, um, and also USC has been incredibly supportive. I've done all, most all of my field work out of that institute at Catalina, and they're fantastic out there. And I've also relied on all of these people who have gone diving with me, which should tell you how much I've gone diving. <laughs> Um, and especially those two people pictured up in the upper right there, Christy and Pauline, have been my dive buddies unfailingly. So with that, I encourage you to visit marineinvasives.org if you're interested in learning more. You can also download a lot of resources um, from that site. And if we have any time, I'll take questions. Or have yeah, to so after. let's give a big round of applause. <laughs> this is a great presentation. So interesting. I learned so much tonight. My brain is full. So if anyone has any questions, um, I'd love to come to you with the mic. Um, you didn't mention like temperature rise uh, in the sea as a possible factor. Is there any information on that? Is that influencing the success of invasives? Yeah, great question. So um, you noticed in that figure I showed from 
the Peace Film Park Service in Anacapa that increased starting in 2013. That does kind of coincide with when we started seeing some warmer waters in this area. And I can tell you at Catalina that it's been a number of years of seeing hardly any kelp out there. And uh, I, I don't think that it's because of the sargassum, but I, you know, it, we have seen an increase in sargassum. And it may not be a coincidence that we're now seeing on Daria last summer, um, after these few years when the native species have had a rougher go of it with the warmer water that they're not so well adjusted to. So um, I, I do think it's creating more of an opportunity for these invasives. The time will tell once the water cools off again, hopefully, um, whether they sort of go, go back in the holes or um, whether they make the recovery of the natives more challenging. Um, so yeah, stay tuned for that. But there, there is a lot of conversation in the invasive species realm about climate change and whether that's going to lead to more invasions. And, um, you know, some species will be able to, uh, I think they're going to be winners and losers, but certainly it does sort of favor species that can be, have wider ranges of uh, thresholds for temperatures and things like that. And so I think we can expect to see more. I don't know if this is a, a good question or not, but so is the solution to make everything an MPA? <laughs> uh, that's not a realistic solution. I didn't think solution. so. <laughs> no, that wasn't my point. I just think it's sort of interesting that, you know, I'm not sure the MPAs were designed with invasive species in mind, but it might be just an added benefit for us to recognize that just, you know, having more resilient ecosystems in general um, is a good thing, and this may just be another example of that. Thank you. My, my questions relate to pre preventive. Uh -huh. um, you mentioned, if I got it correctly, that uh, $130 billion is spent on inv invasive species in the, in the national park system? No, not quite. Um, okay. So $130 billion in the U.S., that includes the money that's spent on managing invasive species okay. in the whole country. And it also includes what's been calculated as the economic cost that comes along with invasive species. Okay, then I'd like an, two, two little follow-ups. Yeah. Do you know how much, what percentage-wise, half, a third, is related to your kind of work on the marine uh, invasives? Marine invasives. Maybe that's not an answerable question. but What proportion of that? You know, you I think? think a minimal proportion is figured into that number because um, minimal, there isn't, okay. there just isn't a lot of talk about marine invasives yet. Okay. Um, people are That's more focused said. on pests. Um, yeah. Okay. And then um, you talked about uh, one of the areas is the when you were, your cartoon at the very end with the boats. Yeah. I don't know much about the way the waters go in and out of the boats, but is there a screening process for that water? Good question. Yes. So um, there is, and actually I didn't go into this there, but a lot. what a lot of vessels do is they actually do a flushing out in the open ocean, right? If you're thinking of drawing water up in one port and going to another, those might be really comparable habitats. And so whatever you're letting out is very likely to be uh, happy there. But if you, uh, out in the open ocean, sometimes what they'll do is a flushing where they'll take, they'll let it go, take in open ocean water, which doesn't have a lot living in it, right? A couple flushes and then let that out in the port. And so that's one way that they minimize the spread okay. of things. Okay. Then, um, I don't, you may have read that in uh, the boats are having, you talked about fuel efficiency. Uh -huh. I have one more little point after this. Yeah. Fuel efficiency uh, that they, the boats now are coming out with a paint that you've heard about this, the paint yeah. that evo evo avoids the algae. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, but that, and that also is, uh, the boats want to use that because as you said, it uh, the fuel efficiency is increased when they use this paint as well. Well, that's good. I don't, I don't know the name of it, but I saw it in the Wall Street Journal about a month ago. I can't remember either. Maybe you folks oh. know more about that. Yeah. I know, I just, and then the follow-up thing I want to say to you is that um, I'm going to check the ocean principles for, see if there's anything uh, about teaching the young about the invasives. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do you have a correction about my no. ballast water answer? I only have one question. <laughs> oh, um, I don't know how much uh, the word gets out to schools, because I happen to be in the Native Plant Society 
you know, so I'm aware of what's going on on land. But um, I saw this great Hugh Hauser last night and this teacher, junior high teacher, brought these kids out to this arroyo. And it was just a, it was a wetland arroyo that was totally polluted and it was full of trash. And every year she brought her class out there and they cleaned it up and they got it to be natural again. And That's now they great. maintain it. Yeah. And, and and then the native plants cleaned up the water. Uh-huh. And so just education would make a, that's all I'm saying. It looked like education it would help. Absolutely. You know, and it, it's fun to think about, well, if, if everyone chips in, maybe there's a dent we can make. It's it's hard when you think about the marine environment, right? It's It's a lot more inaccessible. But, you know, there's certainly the more people are thinking about and talking about this sorts of stuff is great. So I think just teaching people, you know, I like to think of this as kind of a case study and get just, like I said, to get people talking about marine invasive species and thinking about it. And so I think there's definitely education opportunities for that. Thank you. Um, I've had background with organic agriculture and encountered the problems of uh, invasive species there too. And what we're finding is that uh, Many of the the invasive species in agriculture are also traceable to the harbors, to the imports. Um, When I first came to the county in 1990, most um, avocados were sort of uh, um, organic by default because it just wasn't necessary to use anything. There weren't any, for the most part, natural pests. And now... It's every few years, every three, four, five years, they discover a new one, usually on one of the roads leading out from the port. And so it's clearly a consequence of trade, of importing Mexican avocados or other uh, from other southern sources into some of the only terrain we have here that can grow avocados, Mm -hmm. and then being all surprised that 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 that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking maybe. Maybe it's time that that uh, um, trade agreements provide for some level of mitigation because this is now predictable, right? You know, and I think it could be calculated. You know, I don't have the numbers at hand, but somebody could put that together, and I think the argument can ma- be made because I, you know, I I put I don't even know how many times I've been out to Anacapa. Um, taking out that ice plant and gathering native seed and planting it all out and and uh, um, th- there's a whole big world out there that needs this and volunteers cannot keep up with that. Right. You know, it's going to have to be done. You know, really ramped up in a in a more systematic way than that. So I, totally I applaud agree. what you're doing here to document what's happening and how and you know, what what makes sense in trying to to address it. Excellent. So, thank you. Thank you. Lindsay, you may be aware of this, uh, but our local sanctuary advisory committee is uh, right in the last few meetings is starting to make an effort to get the word out and just trying to figure out what the best strategy is so that uh, mm-hmm. boaters, divers, and everyone can be uh, informed of this and how we can best do it. So for everybody else, uh, People are working on this and people are concerned. And I'm sure you're aware of what the sanctuary is doing. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. We have been working with them to develop these materials. And um, I'm actually, I'll be talking. (laughs) If you're attending the meeting next week, you'll get this again. (laughs) Any other questions? Well, I'm a boater, and this is news, this particular species, but, if, you know, if you're out there and you drop an anchor, when you pull it up, you're just going to, you know, pull off whatever weeds and throw them back. So, you know, educating the boaters, I think that would be really helpful. Absolutely. Yes. So one of those flyers that I um, showed you, oh, wrong one, um, is, oh, I may as well just do this. Do, do, do. That's the goal of this one here. So we're planning, we actually are, this is hot off the presses, but we're trying to post these around harbors and places where folks are going to see them. We're talking about maybe including them in bill slips, and there's a maybe a bigger plan that the sanctuary is working up to try to include some kind of educational materials um, that come along with registration. Um, so, yes, I totally agree. We're kind of starting to work on that. 
And if, if, if any of you are willing to sort of help distribute this material, please get in touch with me. Um, and I'm happy to send you whatever you need. We'd appreciate you helping to get the word out. Any other questions? Oh. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Good for you guys for coming to learn about it. <laughs> Thank you. So my question is, um, the invasive species, when you were pulling it out, you said there wasn't a lot of uh, bio, uh, bio catch or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, would the native stuff, would you end up finding more biocatch? Do you notice if, if it's not supporting the native stuff or don't know? or? That's a good question. So we were more looking for bigger things um, like abalone or fish that would have, we were more concerned about the vacuum aspect of it, right? If you could see that was a good amount of pull it had. And so we just wanted to make sure that we weren't scooping things up. But of course, that would have been things that were living in the algae. Um, I can tell you, my very first summer as a grad student, I did a project where I looked at what was living on the sargassum. So I collected it and looked at it, I rinsed it off and collected it all and preserved it all and spent a whole summer looking under a microscope at what was living on there. And um, we found a lot of, they're called mesoinvertebrates, but it's just these basically little bugs. Um, and actually I found that uh, there's about twice as much biomass of those little bugs on sargassum as you would find on giant kelp for example. So it is really good habitat for those little critters. And those are fish food. Um, so in a way, they're really good habitat for supporting those sort of um, little marine bugs, basically fish food. But, um, but the, the catch is that it only has that kind of big biomass for those couple months out of the year. And so it's only a, a resource like that for uh, a very ephemeral sort of amount of time. And so um, that's mostly what we found on them. We really didn't find anything bigger living in them. In macrocystis, right, you'll find things like fish recruit to the canopy. A lot of things, crabs and things like to live in there. There's more a bigger structure to support bigger things. And you wouldn't find that on sargassum. It's just too light and delicate. The question. Any other questions? Okay, well, it seemed to turn into more of a comment period, but I like it. I like how excited everybody seems about this issue, and it's great to have someone come talk to us about ways we can spread the word, because I think that seems like the really important part is getting the word out about this. So let's give another round of applause to Lindsay.